Hello everyone, I'm glad you're here with me again. This time I have a question from Philip. And Philip is asking, what does anchoring conversation mean? The comment was under the video, should I argue with people? Because I talked about it there. I replied shortly on one of my Telegram channels, but I wanted to talk about it also here because I see that this technique is being uh, used and abused. It's becoming more vicious and more destructive. And it's being even abused by those new kind of aggressive marketing and storytelling. So I answered there that it's a conversation that aims to buy time in order to anchor the subject in the territory of the target in order to achieve undeclared objectives, like testing the boundaries or studying the target, of course, to neutralize his or her resistance mechanisms and sell him or her something through that emotional manipulation. They need this manipulation perhaps because the product is not so good, it's not good enough to be bought, or perhaps the service is so bad that it's not being hired, or perhaps out of greed. So they have no problem to prey on others. Think about someone knocks on your door, he wants to sell you something, but he doesn't declare that. But rather he says, Hello Mr. Jabbering, 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 as if he couldn't read it correctly. As if he cares so much about my feelings, that he wants to make the extra mile. He wants to make an effort to show me that he's making an effort to pronounce my name correctly. Now, in my situation, I can immediately detect those techniques and the cheap corporate crash courses that teach them. But depending on the situation and the person, I would respond accordingly. So after his monologue about my name, trying to use my name as a hook, I might say, it is not relevant. How can I help you? Of course, I say that in case the person is empathic, who's being pushed into using such predatory techniques. But in case the person is a predator, I would say, none of your business, what do you want? Of course, I need the relevant counterpart action in order to neutralize them and set the boundaries more precisely. Now, it's important to remember that those are merely examples. And any response should not be based on my examples or in general concepts. But in order for it to be successful, it should be relevant to the moment after seeing it holistically and the details. In many cases, it's important to make them declare their intentions directly after the salute. That's important to avoid their traps. Anyway, the surprise effect was on their side. Most people are, quote, not ready for such encounters. And most people fall for the distraction because they feel more safe in indirect communication. And they start to answer questions like students programmed since childhood to answer questions of the teacher. Your name is Kanevsky? Kanevsky? Kanievsky, now have a couple of minutes talking only about the name, the pronunciation, the origins of the name, and perhaps another trivial subject. All that without declaring yet why he or she are still standing in front of the door. Of course, things can get here more sophisticated. I'm only sketching a general idea here. Things don't have to be only about the name. It can also be initiating a small talk, asking about the time, or just one more question, or even the illusion of authority through body language and vocal quality, or even using a certain ethos. For example, saying that they are from the Red Cross. As if this is something that should make you feel ashamed of yourself if you reject them. Or like one time an intern of one of the most corrupt banks in Germany wanted a donation from me to save the children. It was to save the children. Or sometimes they want to save the climate. They are shameless, those. Of course, the presenter who was an intern, a young intern, had no idea what she was talking about and what all that was about. But while the employees of her bank level hangover after exclusive champagne parties in private yachts and in private jets escorted by elite lap dancers, they come to me to take donations from me to save the children? Of course, the intern had no idea what I was talking about. Anyway, remember, after all, all they want is not to exchange anything with you, but to take something from you. They might make it look like as if it's about win-win or as if it's an exclusive club, or it's an opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity. But this is only what they say, not what they intend or how they act. Now this illusion of authority, whether it is the bank or 
a non-profit organization or an official institute. Such ethos is used frequently because people live in fear of authority and their primary education was based upon obedience of authority and obedience of the system. I had even two men knocking on my door. They wanted to sell me a contract for their internet company, but they didn't present themselves as sellers. After I say about my name, none of your business, what do you want? They present themselves with a verbal language and a body language that is intended to create confusion and to portray them as if they are the cable company that is updating the cables in the neighborhood and as if they are the authority to connect or disconnect any cables in the neighborhood. After they said we are from this company and that company and we are making a campaign in the neighborhood, I interrupted them immediately and I said, I don't care who you are. I said, what do you want from me? Why are you in front of my door? They repeated the same monologue with more emphasis with their body language on terms like campaign, our team, and other militant and corporate terminology in order to make sure I buy into their illusion that they have any authority whatsoever to activate or deactivate my personal internet cables. Of course, I didn't buy into it, and I interrupted them one more time. I don't care who you are. What do you want? They were so confused because I did not buy into the fake authority. I was not intimidated or irritated. And then they immediately declared their intentions that they just wanted to sell me a contract for their company. Of course, I rejected them and exposed them for their sneaky methods. Now, they wanted to sell me a contract, but to anchor their presence, they portrayed themselves as if they are essential and urgent. Fortunately, they can't manipulate me, but I don't know how many people fall for it so that they have such a high level of confidence and conviction as if those methods work for them in 100% of their encounters. Now, this is happening also in all fields of marketing and storytelling and films. And this is actually the reason why I wanted to make this video, why I wanted to reply to this comment also with this video, because I see how much money and resources are being invested in the hook. But after that, the quality drops and the hooked is lost. You start to watch a film, it's impressive. The intro is emotional. The cinematography is impressive. You are hooked. But many times, this hook is only the first couple of minutes of the film. It is designed to hook people in, neutralize their resistance mechanisms, and watch till the end. Though the film loses that magic and gradually becomes less attractive. If you are an awakened spectator, you would detect that immediately and would stop that film. If one is not aware, one would stay hypnotized or one would compromise and watch the film till the end because one has already started. Now, it would have not been such a big deal if after the hook, the film is at least harmless. But what if after the hook starts political indoctrination? In the first half an hour, the film looks good. It's based purely on universal values. But toward the end, we start uh, seeing political agendas and gender agendas and virtue signaling and narcissist agendas scapegoating their empaths and downplaying the cruelty of the narcissists and their golden children, perhaps a police state agenda, portraying everyone as a criminal and only the bureaucrats are the heroes, even when they are corrupt. So we need to stay awake all the time and observe the transformation. Anchoring might start friendly or harmless, but after one is hooked, it gradually transforms into wasting your time, or wasting your money, or preying on you emotionally. But if one detects that, not only that one would set boundaries and would avoid that trap, but one would grow more self-esteem and spiritual forces that give us the emotional abilities of conception and judgment, and then creativity, sovereign survival, and transcendence. I hope I could shed some light on this. Thank you, Philip, for inspiring this video. Thank you, everyone, for staying with me. I'm Shredi Jabarin. Ciao.